Hello and happy new year. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for the first Colorado Legislative Arts Caucus event of 2021. I'm Kristen Crampton Day, Executive Director of Colorado Business Committee for the Arts, CBCA. As a nonprofit organization, CBCA has been advancing Colorado's creative economy by connecting business in the arts for over 35 years. We are thrilled to partner with Arts for Colorado to host today's event. On the agenda, we, we'll hear the latest data on Colorado's creative sector and the impacts of COVID-19, followed by presentations from four of our state certified creative districts, and then allow time at the end for Q&A. Before we introduce our legislators and speakers today, I'd like to go over, go over some Zoom housekeeping tips. Today's event is on the Zoom webinar platform. Thus, attendees will remain muted and cameras off. We ask that all presenters keep their microphones off unless speaking to avoid background noise. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. You can submit your questions throughout the event and we will save time at the end for Q&A. You can use the chat box to share other comments and reactions. Take a moment now and please introduce yourself in the chat. We have attendees joining from all over the state. Be sure to send your chat message to all panelists and attendees. We appreciate you, you keeping your comments res respectful and on topic today. Closed captioning is also available. So with that, thank you to our Colorado, Colorado legislators for joining us here today. Um, obviously, this is a topic that's a, a lot of interest to people because we have, um, I think, about 230 people that ha are attending today, which is great to have such a wonderful turnout. We are honored and grateful to have so many elected officials that care about the arts in our state. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge those in attendance and invite them to briefly introduce themselves for those that um, are able to join us today. So first I'll start out with, <clears throat> excuse me, Representative Leslie Herod. Leslie, if you're there, if you wanna say hello. <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. Representative Denea Escar, Representative Judy, Amabile. Again, if you're there, please just speak up. It's hard for me because I can't see you. <laughs> um, <I am. laughs> so, yes, if you're there, please say hello. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> arts is, uh, is a pretty big deal in, in the rural part of my, uh, of my district. So, uh, curious to see what we, what we learn here today. Wonderful. Um, and thank you, Senator Dennis uh, Heisey, who is just speaking there. Um, Representative Shannon Bird, are you with us today? Okay. Senator Jeff Bridges. Okay. Uh, Representative Yadiro Caraveo. Representative Lisa Cutter. Representative Kathy Kipp. Senator Sonia Yaquez Lewis. Again, if you're there, say hello. Senator Pete Lee. Sen Senator Paul Lundeen. Senator Brittany Peterson, Representative Dylan Roberts, Senator Cleve Simpson, Representative Mark Snyder. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Tanya Van Bieber. Senator Hello, Rob, oh, wonderful, thank you. Senator Rob Woodward. 
and Representative Mary Young. So, so those of um, legislators that were able to join us, um, if you if you want to take a quick minute to introduce yourselves and um, your districts and what you represent, um, please please do so. Um, I maybe um, Senator Heisey, if we want to start with you, and um, just want to take a minute to allow each of you to to say more than hello. <laughs> Although I think you're on mute. Let's see. Um, who else is there? Would someone else like to, to go from the group? Um, Mark Snyder here. Uh, Thank I'm you. glad to go. I represent House District 18, which is downtown Colorado Springs, uh, to my little town of Manitou Springs. We're very proud that we have two creative districts in House District 18, and we have a vibrant and thriving arts community. I'd like to say the best in the state, but I'm really happy to be on this call and looking forward to hearing from everybody. So thank you very much. Wonderful. And it looks like um, Senator Bridges just joined. Would you like to introduce yourself? You bet. Hey, I'm Senator Jeff Bridges and I represent South Metro Denver and very excited for the discussion today. I was actually part of the governor's uh, group in the post pandemic world to try and figure out ways we could help all of the great organizations on here today survive through uh, a very, very difficult time, especially for arts organizations uh, that pretty much depend on folks coming through in person and uh, have seen some pretty creative solutions here and excited to hear uh, today's panelists. Wonderful. Thank you, Senator Bridges. Um, also, how about um, Representative Van Bieber, if you'd like to take a moment? Yes, um, I'm Tanya Van Bieber, and I represent Weld County, Northern Colorado, and uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say today. Um, we have a personal interest here in our family, as our son is a classically trained operatic tenor, so um, I'm very excited for the arts to get back to, to normal so that we can see him pursue that in his capacity. So, and thank you for all that you're doing for this very important aspect of Colorado. Thank you, Representative Van Bieber, and I apologize for pronouncing your, your name incorrectly. Um, it, it looks like we also have Representative Dylan Roberts has joined us. If you'd like to say a few words. Come off mute. <laughs> Perhaps not yet, but but um, if, if you'd like to um, uh, join us later, that would be great or turn on your camera. Uh, is there anyone else I missed who has joined um, uh, since we were doing, oh, I see um, uh, Representative Shannon Bird. Would you like to take a minute to say hello and, and um, provide a little background about yourself? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. I had to get away from the TV. Um, <laughs> hi there, I'm Shannon Bird. I represent um, the Adams County portion of Westminster, that's House District 35. Um, thrilled to be here. The arts I know play a crucial role in our state and in our economy and in the quality of lives of, of all Coloradans. And um, I'm interested to hear from um, those who actually make this possible and find out how the legislature can be a strong partner in um, kind of booing the, the group through this really difficult time in our state's history. Thank you very much. Um, it, it looks like um, we also just had um, Representative Judy Amabile join us. Um, Judy, if you wanna take, uh, take your camera on. Oh, did we just lose her? No, I'm here. Oh, good. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard with this Hollywood squares. Um, but no. thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And if you just want to take a minute to introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Judy Amabile, rep elect from Colorado from House District 13, which is uh, the western part of Boulder, but also uh, Gilpin, Grand, Clear Creek and Jackson counties. And we have obviously in Boulder have a very vibrant arts community and lots of artists and 
Um, so I'm interested in supporting them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other legislators who haven't had an opportunity to introduce themselves that would like to take a moment to do that right now? Okay, well, with that, um, why don't we um, move in? I'd like to quickly acknowledge the sponsors of the recent Senate Bill 20B01, which was passed during the December 2020 special session uh, just before the end of the year. Thank you, Senator Winner, Senator Priola, Representative Herod, and Representative Sandridge for your um, role in that. This bill included 7.5 million, as many of you know, to support arts, cultural, and entertainment artists, crew members, and organizations affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Applications for the new Colorado Arts Relief Fund are due by January 8th, so just two days from now, um, for both individuals and organizations. And I know CCI and their team is working hard on this. Um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Mar Marilyn Luzler with Arts for Colorado to introduce the Arts Caucus concept. And Marilyn, I think you're still on mute. Sorry, everything shut down here. I'll, there you I'll, go. I'll get back to you, just a second. Yeah, my camera's gone as well. I'm so sorry. We can see you okay. Oh, you can? Okay, yeah, great. You're all, you're all okay. Wonderful. So if you can see and hear me, I'm just fine then. So um, as a board member for Arts for Colorado, I just wanted to give you a very brief timeline of the organization's activities. In 2002, Arts for Colorado was launched as a Colorado 501c4 nonprofit arts advocacy organization and began its work to increase support for the arts across the state. In 2010, Colorado Creative Industries was established as a new division of the Office of Economic Development and International Trade and replaced Colorado Council on the Arts. In 2011, um, House Bill 11-1031 uh, passed allowing for formation of Colorado creative districts to be managed by creative industries. In the first round, 49 communities applied for this um, certification. In 2012, the first two creative districts were certified, and there are now 26 such districts across the strait, and you'll hear from several of them during this session. In 2015, Governor John Hickenlooper announced the Space to Create Colorado Initiative with Trinidad named as the demonstration project. An $18 million project with strong local government and community support. The housing portion of the project is complete with 22 of 41 affordable live work units leased. Also a 20,000 square foot, square foot um, Multi-use community space will be opening later this year, probably late summer to early fall. The project repurposed three boarded up turn of the century buildings on Main Street with a second new build location nearby. Ridgeway is the next space to create community slated to begin construction. In 2018, the Legislative Arts Caucus was established and has made great strides in supporting arts and culture across the state. In 2020, the legislature passed Senate Bill 2001, providing seven and a half million for the Arts Relief Fund to help individuals, businesses, and organizations affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as you mentioned, grant applications will close on January 8th and will again be managed by creative industries. In the past 10 years, there have been numerous success stories in communities throughout Colorado, in particular, those in rural areas of the state due in great part to the advocacy of Arts for Colorado, the formation of Colorado Creative Industries, and other arts and culture-based initiatives and programs at the state level. Arts for Colorado is proud to lobby and advocate for state and national financial support for Colorado Creative Industries. Colorado is a clear leader for arts and culture and the creative sector workforce. Arts for Colorado pledges its continued support to keep Colorado in the forefront. Thank you again, everyone, for joining in. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marilyn. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Michael Seaman is Assistant Professor of Arts Management at Colorado State University. Dr. Seaman recently authored Creative Economy Reports for both the City of Denver and the State of Colorado and co-authored Lost Art Measuring COVID-19's Devastating Impact on America's Creative Economy with Richard Florida for the Brookings Institution. He's here to share some of the startling numbers that demonstrate Colorado's decade of artistic growth and the devastating impact of this pandemic. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Seaman. Hey, hi, hello, it's an honor to be here uh, and thank you for uh, visiting with us. Uh, so yes, I'm a, a assistant professor of arts management at Colorado State University. And I started this year working uh, for Colorado Creative Industries on a way to examine how uh, big the scale and scope of the creative economy is in the state of Colorado. Uh, I ended the year in working on a much different project. So what I'd like to do is uh, we'll walk through uh, just basic details of the creative economy and look at how COVID impacted it. And at the very end, uh, maybe some thoughts for the future. Uh, now I'm not controlling the slide, so I'll have next slide, please. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, in general, uh, I, I looked at the creative economy and put it into nine different industry clusters. And uh, so you have things like music, theater, dance, and visual arts, the clear leader, but things like publishing, architecture, creative technology, things like social media and uh, web content. And then examined how many people work in this and uh, how, how much this brings in in terms of sales of goods and revenue. Now, one thing to remember is the creative economy in general is composed of two parts, uh, the creative industries and creative occupations. Creative industries uh, consider everybody that works for an industry. So if you have a graphic design, or let's say an advertising firm, it counts the person that's a graphic designer, the art director, but also the accountant and the receptionist. Uh, creativity is provided uh, for all of these jobs. So for the industry side of things, uh, things were looking very good. Uh, about 191,000 jobs, which is 5% of the state's employment. Uh, sales of goods and services or sales revenue, $31.6 billion, which is uh, a very significant uh, substantial number. And that's about 4% of all of the sales revenue within the state, uh, sales of goods and uh, services. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the growth was, was really uh, quite significant. So from 2010 to 2019, uh, overall, you have about a 25% growth within uh, the creative industries. That is substantial. Uh, when you're looking at growth in industries, anything that's over 5% uh, is important. 25% is phenomenal. And it was led by uh, the culinary arts, which uh, basically you're looking at craft brewing, uh, the rise of uh, artisan liquors, uh, wines, but also artisan foods uh, and, and things like uh, cheeses and, and different snacks, uh, things like that. That's a really solid uh, part of the creative economy within Colorado. Uh, but if you look, uh, every each cluster basically had tremendous growth, double digit growth, except for publishing, but that's really a sign of the times. And a lot of that has been picked up by creative technology as we see things that are in print um, start to uh, move online. But again, uh, all, all nine clusters, really solid, uh, great growth, super healthy. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, it's also important that the whole state is creative. Uh, it's not all states are like this. Um, our urban regions are doing very well, but our, the rural regions are doing very well. So if you look at uh, the Front Range, you have uh, North Central that would have like where I am in Fort Collins and, and Weld County as well. Uh, but you also have down the South Central part of the state, which is uh, includes Pueblo. Uh, and then uh, the Denver uh, MSA, basically the Denver region, the whole Front Range. Uh, did very, very well. Um, you're adding um, well over 30 some thousand jobs and a double, again, double digit percentage growth. But if you look at the Western Slope, it's also double digit growth. Uh, and you know, again, creativity is with throughout the state and we're very good at monetizing it throughout the state. Even the Eastern Plains, which are you know, 
less populated, uh, there's still uh, growth within that 10, uh, the nine years of um, uh, that was examined. Uh, and we're looking at several thousand jobs. So again, the whole state, the creative economy is across it uh, and is uh, woven into it. And in general, uh, you have 38,000 jobs total in growth in those nine years. Again, very impressive, 25% growth. Uh, next slide. Now let's dial back a bit and let's look at the other side of the creative economy. And that is, that, uh, is creative occupations. So that's someone like, let's say that graphic design, that graphic designer, you know, maybe he, do, he she, they don't work in uh, a creative industry. Perhaps that graphic designer works in aerospace uh, or uh, the healthcare field or IT. Uh, there are thousands of people that are uh, in creative occupations that don't work in the creative industry. Uh, and their growth was uh, very beneficial as well. So if you look at 2010, uh, about 138,000. By 2019, uh, 172,000 people in creative occupations. And again, that's uh, in creative industries, but also in non, or what you would consider non-creative industries. Uh, and that's a 25% growth. Top 10 creative occupations, uh, Again, the state, it runs the gamut. You have photographers, writers, authors, graphic designers, musicians. You know, Colorado is a creative state. And this is, again, across the state, rural and urban. And not all states are like that. We're very uh, fortunate to have that sort of concentration uh, statewide. OK, so I was working on this. And in about March, uh, a global pandemic broke out. Uh, and it, it spared no one. And I was asked by Governor Polis's task force to think about uh, and be able to project um, how badly this would uh, uh, injure the state's music industry. Uh, and I got the call on Friday and it was to be due Monday. Uh, I realized then that this was going to be a, a bigger trend. Uh, so I, I looked and examined the, uh, the effects of the COVID-19 crisis on the music industry, but then quickly pivoted to looking at the entire creative economy. Uh, this was something that if I, I've worked in uh, economic impacts and development and culture for years, and generally you look at how these things were assessed before. Well, in this case, there really wasn't any precedent. Uh, I had to look at things like natural disasters. Uh, the closest I could come was, what happens if Hurricane Katrina hit everywhere all at once and globally? So uh, next slide, please. I quickly, uh, and it started quickly, but then unfortunately, as we all know, uh, it became a long running um, research project of mine. I had to create a somewhat of an economic model. Uh, and that started with informal interviews with those in the industries, uh, perspectives published in media outlets, private firms, government agencies, non-government agencies. Uh, everyone was examining this at the same time. And again, it was predicting something uh, that was continuing to unfold uh, with uh, no clear precedent. Uh, I had to consider effects of local and statewide stay at home and safer at home orders, uh, the closing of non-essential businesses. Uh, at first we thought live events would come back within maybe the fall. Now we know it's, uh, and, and as I was working on it, I realized live events weren't coming back till sometime in 2021 at the earliest. Uh, the idea that there's access to federal stimulus funds, uh, or in some cases, uh, not as much access. And that's for firms, establishments, the self-employed, uh, which is a huge portion of the creative economy. I uh, took into consideration a 24% contraction of the U.S. economy with an average of 14% unemployment that was at that time projected uh, for quarter two. Uh, and I... This is super important for the creative economy. I had to include people that are laid off, furloughed, whether it's permanently, part-time, those working freelance who lost gigs. Uh, again, if you are a musician, say a DJ, and you had a string of DJ gigs, you basically are out of work now and you've lost your job. Uh, in all cases, I also had to look at too, uh, what the recovery would look like. Would it be uh, a V shape, meaning you lost everything and it came back? Would it be you, a slow, uh, gradual coming back? Uh, would it be an L shape, meaning you've lost everything and it continues to be at a, a zero rate until sometime in the future? Uh, and that was for 110 different industries in those nine industry clusters. 
And it wasn't all monolithic, even in the music industry. Uh, if you worked in a club or owned a, a venue, uh, you were an L shape. Basically, you laid everyone off. Uh, if you're lucky, you could get the uh, pandemic and uh, payment protection. Uh, in some cases that didn't always work and you had nothing uh, and you still unfortunately have nothing. Uh, whereas if you were say a, a mastering engineer working on physical products, uh, you may have actually increased uh, your revenues and your jobs because now a lot of people are having their records and uh, uh, things that are going to be streaming on the radio that need to be mastered. So it was really uh, a a very overwhelming uh, uh, job, uh, but one that in, it required me to talk to as many people as possible and to get as much information as possible to make uh, a, a, an informed uh, estimates. Uh, and they continued to change as I went along. So next slide, please. The result of this is uh, an estimated loss uh, between April uh, 1st and July 31st of about 59,588 jobs, uh, sales revenues uh, decreased by about 2.6 billion. And put that in perspective, that's 31% of employment in the entire creative economy and 8% of the annual sales revenue lost within those four months. Uh, now music, theater, dance, and visual arts uh, really took the brunt of this. Uh, of all the jobs lost, that was about 50% of them and about 30% of all sales revenue loss. Uh, this was staggering, uh, easily the, the largest um, numbers I had to, to work with uh, in terms of losses. And I, I've, I've done this before for things, say, in West Texas, what happens when crude goes down uh, a couple dollars a barrel? How does that affect? It was nothing like this. Uh, now, uh, I've been keeping tabs on this going forward. Uh, and now, at this point, I was projecting, uh, estimating, because there was no data. Uh, now, uh, what I expect to happen is people will start to look at this now that data is coming out in terms of this quarter, second quarter, or third quarter. But just putting my projections, uh, my estimated projections forward to now, uh, you're looking at maybe uh, approximately about 15 to 20,000 of those jobs are returning. Uh, but again, uh, music, theater, and dance, uh, visual arts is just their percentage of all jobs lost really are increasing. So you have things like in design, broadcasting, uh, those, some, many of these people were laid off, they're coming back. Um, that's not really the case in music, theater, dance, and visual arts. Unfortunately, uh, those jobs are still just not there at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So some things to think about. Uh, work in a creative economy is precarious and we all know this, but it is so important to think about this. Many of these people uh, that work in it have several jobs. So again, we're talking about jobs lost uh, and in many cases they're temporary losses, but as we've seen uh, in music, uh, this temporary loss has now extended for about 10 months. Uh, but it's not uncommon for someone to have a job in, uh, say, a recording engineer who also works at a venue, who may also work with sound and films. Uh, it could very well easily be one person has lost three jobs. Uh, that is compounded when you look at the absolute carnage that has happened to the restaurant industry, the service industry, because a lot of people uh, in the creative economy rely on those uh, side gigs as well to make a career. Uh, this is a crisis situation. There's also thousands, remember, in creative occupations that are working in other industries with their own uh, situations that are unfolding because of COVID. So that graphic designer or architect that works in a retail establishment, uh, maybe the headquarters, they could very well be having a tough situation as well. But the important thing to keep in mind is before COVID, uh, Colorado's creative economy was thriving and we have the infrastructure, it's still there. Uh, we just have to address what is now a crisis situation. But as we go forward, uh, you know, demography is destiny. 51% of the United States, uh, the population are either millennials or generation Z, and they are driving this before COVID experience economy. They want to purchase uh, events and experiences and not items. Colorado is perfectly set up for that. We were thriving in terms of festivals, concerts, tourism. That will come back and that will come back strong after COVID-19 is finally, um, uh, we mitigate those situations. So now is the time to think, 
what's going to happen afterwards because we have all the pieces. It's just a matter of planning for the future. Again, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you, Michael. And we will have hopefully some time for Q&A at the end. I know there are some questions that came through during your presentation and we'll be sure to address those questions then. Um, we're running a little behind schedule, so I am gonna keep things moving for the time um, and turn it over to our partners at Colorado Creative Industries. CCI is our state arts agency housed at the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. Margaret Hunt, director, will give an overview of the agency and their creative district program, um, which Marilyn had touched on. And Christy Costello, deputy director, will tee up our four guest speakers representing the creative districts in Pueblo, Denver County, including Rhino, Westwood, and Santa Fe, Durango, and Grand Lake. So we've got a lot more planned. So with that, uh, Margaret, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Michael, for that great presentation. And Thanks, Marilyn, for teeing this up so beautifully. Um, Creative Industries is a unique agency in that we are both a state arts agency as well as an economic development agency. And we're unique in the country. We're the only one of our kind. So we're really proud of that. And that gives us the flexibility to be able to respond to economic challenges in a unique way compared to other states. So it's something that uh, we're, really, um, we're really proud of. Um, just, just as a general overview, you've heard about our creative district program. Marilyn mentioned Space to Create. I would just add that in addition to uh, Trinidad, which is now being occupied, um, Ridgeway hopes to enter into construction on their project in the first quarter of 2021. And the town of Grand Lake um, has a presentation to their town council on a site tonight. So there's a community of several hundred people um, up to, uh, you know, about a thousand people in Ridgeway and, and then uh, about 9,000 people in Trinidad. So this program is designed specifically to help our smaller rural communities attract and keep creative people in their communities. In addition to that, we also administer the Art and Public Places program uh, for all state um, government buildings with the 1% for public art. Uh, and then we provide grants uh, to organizations and a special thanks to our members of the legislature who are on this call uh, for your bold action in providing us with seven and a half million dollars to allocate to these organizations and individuals who are in distress from this crisis that we're facing right now. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Christy Costello. She's the Deputy Director of Creative Industries, and she also manages the Creative District Program. So Christy, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks, Margaret. Um, well, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to work with all of these amazing communities around the state that are striving to incorporate arts and creative industries into their community and economic development plans. Um, it's really, amazing to get to see the impact that this has around the state and um, I have the pleasure of introducing some of the leadership, some of the people that really make this impact happen in the creative districts around the state um, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about what their creative district is like, the impact that it has on the local level and then kind of how things are going for them right now in the context of COVID-19. Um, so I'll start by introducing Karen Fogelsong. She's the executive director at the Pueblo Arts Alliance and Pueblo Creative Corridor. Hi, Karen. Hi, thank you, Christy. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I, as Christy said, I'm Karen Fogelsong, the executive director of Pueblo Arts Alliance and the manager of the Pueblo Creative Corridor. We are also the proud home of the Impact Youth Initiative and the Arts Alliance Studios. We are located in the Pikes Peak Wonders region of Southern Colorado. And we are currently and gratefully funded by our community supporters, members, the Packard Foundation, the Robert Hogue Rawlings Foundation, Pueblo City and County, Colorado Tourism Office, the National Endowment for the Arts and Arts and Society. And of course, we are aligned with Colorado Creative Industries. 
a creative corridor, while it sounds like one thing is really a collection of moving parts and what all those parts have in common, sometimes all those things, all they have in common is the success of our communities in Colorado. And we held our Creative Corridor Grand Opening in 2012, and it was a wonderful celebration with businesses and artists all pitching in to create parades and demonstrations and performances. Now, since that time, we've seen a constant stream of activities come out of our corridor and a greater understanding of the importance of creative industry to our economy. It's an area of diverse populations for generations. Our Creative Corridor is I believe successful partly because of our community's commitment to allow each other the freedom to thrive. And we're not perfect by any means, but on any given day, you will find people from all walks of life interacting with one another to create something fun or interesting or caring for our community. The geographical breakdown of sales tax collected in Pueblo shows that the downtown area is either the second highest or the first highest collected depending on the time of year. And we are down this year, of course we are. But to be clear, a portion of the creative corridor, just a portion, is the second highest earning geographical area in Pueblo. This means that when combined, the sections of our corridor have the highest earning potential in a city that estimates 70% of all economic activities are generated by consumer spending. So it's not difficult to see how the Creative Corridor grand opening coincides with increases in sales tax revenue from 2013 on. In 2015 and 16, we jumped 7.4%. In 17 and 18, we saw an overall rise, but not as drastic, dropping down under and over 1% respectively. And in 2019, we jumped again 5.12%. Now, I'm not saying that the Creative Corridor is the only contributing factor, not by a long shot. Pueblo is a city of over 100,000 folks, and there are fantastic things happening all over the place. But the Corridor received designation in 2012, and the numbers began to rise. So we take pride in being a part of that growth and these numbers. A healthy creative cor corridor not only generates economic activity, it also generates interest, excitement, which naturally flows outward from its origin, stimulating and inspiring as it moves. Um, this, the next slide, please, um, shows density of employment and sales concentrated in the corridor and radiating outward from it. One of our most popular events in the corridor are the First Friday celebrations. And uh, First Fridays allow Pueblo businesses and creatives to celebrate and maintain their individuality while participating in a cooperatively advertised event. On a regular pre-COVID First Friday, galleries were packed with shoppers and sightseers. And there was so much going on in our corridor that it was impossible to experience the entire event. I know I have tried. <laughs> Another example of our group marketing power is our Explorer's Guide, and it is a group published brochure with a map of the corridor that is distributed in Pueblo, surrounding areas, and around the state. And its creation involves a partnership with local graphic design students, which helps to provide real-world experience for young professionals. And under new normal operations, Pueblo businesses are happy to stock our Explorer's Guide because it's become a convenient service to provide to visitors. Um, and while our Creative Corridor is a powerful attraction for new business owners and tourists, it also emanates inspiration outward into Pueblo that echoes the images you're seeing indicating employment and sales density. The hotels surrounding Pueblo send business inward towards our corridor, and our corridor is home to so many attractive businesses, galleries, and eateries that visitors can easily spend the entire day there. And this temptation then generates longer stays in Pueblo, sending business back out to the hotels and leading to more time and money spent in Pueblo. So we like it, right? In some ways, Pueblo's creative corridor has been drastically affected by COVID restrictions. Um, um, sorry, we just recently lost two galleries and a restaurant. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's a small sentence to describe events with large impacts on so many lives. And more are teetering and our theaters are scrambling. But on the other hand, we also have several businesses that are starting or restarting or planning to start soon. So 
Um, our first Fridays through 2019 have been scaled to fit COVID restrictions and allowances. Live events were carefully socially distanced and masked with health, depart health department procedures in place. The number of participants both performing and viewing obviously were drastically reduced. And this of course affected our fundraising and sales. Most of our corridor businesses participated in whatever limited capacity they were able. And when COVID restrictions required, we pulled back to completely digital. Our, for instance, our November event included a gallery digital tour and our December event was a video um, showcasing events that occurred throughout the, the previous year. So um, one consistently tricky COVID challenge has been independent artists without work. So we produced a chalk art pop up and with the help of CCI also a window painting event to provide a potential avenue for income for local artists to create an outdoor event that could be observed from safe distances and to bring focus to the participating businesses. And we got some beautiful pieces and we were able to help out our artists just a little bit. Um, usually our Street Beat program, a partnership with local government to license street performers um, holds live auditions and that's an event in itself. This year they were translated to digital format and many folks were not ready to suddenly uh, use technology to this degree. So while we're producing the event, we are also needing to become teachers to help others come along. And overall, I think it was received pretty well by both the performers and the audience. And we felt this was important because it's really important to maintain local traditions that can safely be implemented. Um, and our live performers were hit particularly hard as we've already heard. A notable this year uh, difference this year, although it's born out of necessity and that I find encouraging is a brainstorming of new ways to move forward. For example, although we lost some of our big sponsors and our sales teams would just suddenly shut down, we did complete our explorer's guide. And then we hit the hurdle of the major businesses did not want to accept them because they'd put up their brochure shelves um, as a COVID-19 prevention. And this showed us that other means might be necessary. So we're exploring digital distribution for future publications with potentially further reach than our brochure alone has ever had. Another example um, of new cooperation that we're excited about is a meditation gallery that we're partnering with. Um, this will uh, be housed near the edges of our union and main sections of our corridor. And this partnership is with the local business Studio Share. And so basically we're creating a gallery that can be toured like a regular gallery, but it also is an ever evolving meditation space. And so obviously another gallery to our corridor adds to the draw of the entirety and gives space to new voices. But we're also, um, our target audiences are a little bit different. So we think that this will provide new experiences for each of them and hopefully we'll swap clients. Um, and so while yes, there have been closures and public sales tax numbers are down, we still have hope and we are looking towards the future. This is due to the resilience of our creatives and the dedication of our community members. No, no one is comfortable, <laughs> but we see hope. And yes, I have collected many fearful stories from creative industry throughout our corridor. Often I hear, I don't know how we're gonna do it. <laughs> but then we do. <laughs> and I believe in my community and our creative corridor and um, we're going to keep moving forward. Thank you guys for your time. And I appreciate all the support from the creative industries. And um, I'm just amazed that Colorado is such a home for creative people. Thanks, Karen. Uh, you, you made me want to visit Pueblo. I really miss the food there. And you just reminded um, me how really persistent and strong and um, adaptive the creative districts have been throughout this process. It's been really inspirational. So thanks for all your hard work. And um, I'll introduce, we have, I'll say we have four um, state certified creative districts in the city and county of Denver. Um, Golden Triangle Art District on Santa Fe, R River North Rhino and Westwood. Um, and I am going to introduce the amazing Tariana Navas Nieves, the Director of Cultural Affairs at Denver Arts and Venues to say a little bit about um, creative districts in the city and county of Denver. Thank you, Christy. And thank you, Karen, for sharing um, from the heart all that Pueblo has done. Uh, it's gonna take definitely collective uh, leadership and love to 
to, to support our sector. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Christy. Thank you. So Denver's art and cultural sector is incredibly diverse and this the city's creative districts are a reflection of that. I will highlight a few, um, as Christy mentioned. And what's unique about the city's creative districts is that they developed organically, each a reflection of their community, of their cultural environment and histories, each with its distinct personality, and each playing a critical role as drivers of the district's economic engine. Um, they are connected to their roots. They are evolving, yet reflecting the changing spaces and where they come from. And as the city, um, and I'm honored to partner with uh, Colorado Creative Industries, our commitment is has been steadfast to support the sustainability of the districts and the role they play in protecting and building thriving communities. Uh, next, please. So I'll start with the art district on Santa Fe, which was one, uh, one of the first two that, uh, districts that were certified by the state is a nationally known uh, district encompassing hundreds of artists, galleries, uh, cultural organizations that truly speak to the history of the area and the diversity of our communities with organizations such as uh, El Centro Su Teatro, Museo de las Americas, and Access Gallery, which works with um, artists with disabilities. These are just some samples of the diversity um, of the Santa Fe Art District. And the district is rooted in La Alma Lincoln Park neighborhood. And this is important to mention. Um, this was once the home of the Arapaho and Cheyenne peoples, railroad workers and immigrants from many parts of the world. And today, um, as the word says La Alma, which means spirit, the district reflects uh, how the district today embraces and celebrates um, the many peoples that made it home many, many generations ago. And today is uh, continues to thrive from the, first, from the famous first Friday art walks to the third Friday art night for first term art buyers. The art district of Santa Fe embodies and supports uh, the creative communities. Next. And speaking of, again, unique personalities, the River North or Rhino Art District is a distinctive area of North Denver that is inclusive of four historical neighborhoods, Globeville, Illyrius, Swansea, Cole, and Five Points. And the district itself, the cultural district, started as a grassroots, grassroots um, movement by local artists. Today, Rhino is a business improvement district, a general improvement district, it has a nonprofit arm as well as a nonprofit fundraising arm. So it's certainly grown tremendously. And while this may be a reflection of how businesses, developers in the artistic community have come together, the district also has a strong history tied to the neighborhoods. Uh, originally home to, you may remember, foundries and industrial spaces in the late 80s and 90s, um, the quarter was left vacant and warehouses uh, became available. And this is the time when many artists moved into the area, joining artists that had been creating in the neighborhoods that I mentioned for generations. So there have been opportunities and challenges connected to this tremendous growth, but there, is, there are certainly a great financial strength for the district uh, and definitely great support for the work that they are um, doing to connect to the neighborhoods that have called home uh, for many, many years. Next. Westwood Creative District. So this is Morrison Corridor, which is at the heart of the city, 1.5 miles and close to 100 businesses. And to give you a sense, again, of the heart and the spirit of Westwood, um, as far as the 2016 census, Westwood student, nearly 80% uh, Latino. Um, Westwood embodies, in my opinion, what culture is, which is not just a theater performance or a painting at a museum, but is a mural on storefronts accessible to all, is about food honoring centuries old tradition, it is about language, it is about the Chile festival that started in 2010. Um, it's about all that, and I think I wanted to highlight um, the nonprofit revision that works towards economic empowerment as a means for uh, warding off displacement. They have a beautiful garden program in which people known as promotoras, 
or community health workers, they partner with families and in relationship building, right? Together with families, they actually work closely to make sure that the gardens get the care they require. And I would say that this, at the heart of Westwood is uh, that relationship piece that has then continues to build um, the, the creative district. Um, they had a neighborhood plan that was adopted by city council in 2016, and they received a creative certification, which I'm looking at my friend Margaret, which we're, we're very excited uh, when they received their certification in 2017. Next. So I want to close um, by, by stating that, as, we'll, as you'll, uh, you've seen with our art and cultural districts, they are microcosms of our city's artistic and, and cultural landscape. Uh, arts, culture, and creative organizations, entertainment spaces, and individual creatives are, as we know, essential to the industry and central to our economic uh, prosperity. Uh, Colorado has thrived in these areas of culture, like Michael said, but the sector is incredibly vulnerable and as at risk at not, of not surviving. This is a grim reality, um, but I'm very hopeful. Um, back in March, when the crisis began, uh, we at Arts and Venues launched one of the first artist relief funds in the country to support basic needs. And artists, as you know, are parts of part of the gig economy, which meant that artists had lost all of their sources of income, many artists, in a matter of days. Even with fundraising support, our initial funding was depleted within hours. And of those first artist applicants, 68% had lost all income sources, 50% were experiencing severe financial distress. And this is back in March. It has only um, worsened. So as we look at 2021, which again, I'm very hopeful, there will undoubtedly be wide uh, ranging and long lasting impacts on Colorado's creative economy and cultural keepers. And we must lead and work to mitigate irreparable uh, damage to art, culture and creative organizations and businesses that have brought national and international investments to Denver and that have been central to our state's economic engine. So as the creative sector is largely immobilized by the economic shock of the pandemic, we must collectively shoulder responsibility for protecting our creative enterprising spaces, our cultural organizations and our cultural communities to protect our community's heritage. And this is a sector that represents the broad demographic diversity of our city, in particular, people of color, First Nations people, and historically marginalized and under-resourced communities. So in summary, arts, culture, and creative uh, non- and for-profit entities and those that represent these entities are responsible for stimulating our creative economy and fostering its reignition as an economic driver. They are and will continue to be essential to our economic recovery, but also to our collective healing. Thank you. Thank you, Tariana. Um, next, I wanna introduce Haley Kirkman. She's the director of the Durango Creative District and they're one of our newer creative districts, but wow, are they organized and doing amazing things. So Haley, can you tell us a little more about what's going on in Durango? Yeah, thanks Christy and CCI and CBCA for inviting me to speak. And thanks to Karen and Tariana for their wonderful presentations. I'm honored to talk to you about the Durango Creative District today. Um, next slide, please. So the Durango Creative District, also known as the DCD, is a nonprofit operating under a fiscal sponsor and we're the 26th Colorado Creative District. Next slide, please. Um, so after the Great Recession hit in 2008, the city of Durango understandably had to make some budget cuts for arts and culture including funding for our art center and our science center. And these funds have not yet been restored. So the city of Durango recognized that the Colorado Creative District program was available and attempted to go for certification twice before, but they didn't have the capacity to fulfill the certification process. But the third time was a charm and due to our incredibly dedicated steering committee that led the charge on the process, we were able to get certified. And since we become certified, the DCD has made significant strides in securing more public funding for arts and culture. 
and the city is recognizing the impact of creative districts and the significant return on investment with public funding. Next slide, please. So if you've ever been to Durango, you know that you have to go quite a ways out of your way to get here to this isolated part of Southwest Colorado. And the same is true for creatives and entrepreneurs that live and work here. Because we're so isolated and we don't have access to as many resources as other uh, metropolitan Colorado cities, they have to work hard to be here. They bring such intentionality and grit and we all thrive on the spirit of collaboration. Now we have all of the offerings that other creative districts have in terms of events and music and art, but we like to boast that Durango previously held the record for having the most restaurants per capita in the United States in prior years. Um, we also have strong regional ties with our neighbors in the county and the Southern Ute Reservation. And that really brings a unique influence and spin to our creative economy. Next slide, please. So there's lots of strengths of the Durango Creative District. And as I mentioned earlier, our community's willingness to collaborate is key to our success. And that's our greatest strength as a community led organization. Our city's willingness to invest in this new and exciting effort has been a significant strength for the sustainability and the growth of our creative economy. And we have a ways to go with this work, but the DCD is actively shedding light on and advocating for this sector. And our organization has successfully launched several programs and projects that you have united our creatives under one umbrella and provided them with valuable resources, such as our creative loan fund with First Southwest Bank and pay, pay, uh, paid public art opportunities and um, online workshops. Next slide, please. So it's no secret COVID-19 has posed a lot of challenges for our community, many of which you have all witnessed firsthand. Businesses and nonprofits have experienced limitations to conduct business, stifled cash flow, inability to connect in person and network with each other, inability to host fundraisers, needing to quickly adapt and bring business online. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, the inability to plan long term, to name a few. And I think that's been the hardest thing for everyone globally is the sheer uncertainty and limitation to preparing. Um, several businesses have shut their doors in Durango as well. Some are hanging on by a thread and some are thriving through this pandemic and getting started. But I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak to our state legislators who understand the impact creative economies have and who strive to listen to the needs of these small businesses and institutions in this major sector of Colorado that really need a lifeboat right now. Um, this is not an easy job, a tireless job, I imagine. And I wanna extend my sincerest thanks to our legislators for working to provide solutions in this crisis. Um, the other challenges that we face are ones that other cities and states face, such as supporting diversity and inclusion and affordability. Um, we're caught in a cycle of needing to bring the talented entrepreneurs into Durango to foster a healthy economy, but we can't do that when housing isn't affordable or when the infrastructure available doesn't meet our demand. Um, we also are needing to be careful in how we grow our economy and tourism without losing our authenticity. Um, it's a delicate dance, but I firmly believe that we're sitting on a gold mine with the DCD, with the Creative District Program, because as long as our creatives have a forum to share ideas and a process in which we can continuously reevaluate what's working for our community and what's not and what our fears are concerning the future, we will be able to keep the creative heart and soul here in Durango and in the state of Colorado amidst this ever-changing landscape of economic downturn, natural disasters, what have you. Next uh, slide, please. Um, finally, our impact, um, you know, it's namely that we are working to bring in new funding opportunities to Durango and new energy, new entrepreneurial energy. 
we recognize the untapped resources that are now readily available to our community through the Creative District program. And our organization gets to be the voice of the creative community, which is often overlooked, underfunded, and vulnerable, as Tariana spoke to earlier. Um, the biggest impact of the Creative District, I'd say, is that we have and will continue to influence local policy and decision making. And we get to support the makers and creatives here that make Durango worth living in. And the DCD has been such an important vehicle for these critical discussions. So like uh, our neighbors in Pueblo and, and Rhino up on the front range, we're working together to keep optimistic and keep moving forward. Thank you. Thanks Haley for sharing what's happening in Durango. Um, next, I would like to invite Ken Fusick. He's the president of the Grand Lake Creative District. Um, I think they're now officially our smallest creative district in the state by population. So, um, but I think with big, big visions um, to be a, you know, worldwide center for uh, folk and craft arts. So Ken, why don't you tell us what's going on in Grand Lake? Thank you, Christy, for rubbing in our size there. Uh, <laughs> it's a great opportunity for us to be here today and tell you a little bit about the Grand Lake Creative District and, and also how important, especially after this year, that support we have gotten from CCI and the state legislature. Um, it's been a tough one for us by, by no small stretch of the imagination. And as many of you have talked about already, we have, we have lost some of our businesses and, and experienced some other difficulties. But let me have next slide. Well, before I start that, I'd like to give you a little bit of, of trivia here. And for all of you in Denver area or that visit Denver, you're all familiar with the Brown Palace and the Ship's Tavern. And if you go into the Ship's Tavern and you turn to your left and there's a big painting of the world on the, on the wall there. And, uh, and of course the United States dominates the, the painting there, but in the middle there where Grand Lake is, the only thing feature that is on that painting and it says Grand Lake, uh, the highest yacht club in the world. And so it's always kind of, I, I tried to find out the history of that painting from the Brown Palace historian, but they didn't even know that was there like that. And so I couldn't get much of the, the history behind it, unfortunately, but, but for all of you who really, and, and it really that harks back to how Grand Lake got started. And, and the fact that the yacht club that came in in 1903, and they put themselves in the map with people like the New York Times and everything with their regattas and, and yacht club races. And, and there's quite a history and lots of interesting stories about our community. And Grand Lake is a small town. We're only 400 people. Um, our main street our, is, is about five blocks long. Our season runs from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day. And that's one of our big challenges and one of the things we're trying to do with, the, uh, with the, uh, our creative district is, is to really expand our uh, wintertime economy. Summers were overrun, of course, um, with, with the traction of Rocky Mountain uh, National Park and all. And, but many times I've been asked, people have asked me, well, what's it like? What's Grand Lake like? And I've always said it's, it's a combination of northern exposure and a river runs through it. Um, we're, we, we have a post office and if you wanna meet your neighbors, that's where you go because that's where everybody goes. Um, we have a grocery store that's got a wood floor that creaks and everybody has told the owners, you do not remove that floor, that floor stays there. So, you know, we have our quirks. You see Lady Gaga there, we tried to run a contest to see who could identify that person, but everybody, 400 people in town responded they knew who that person was. So that's who we are. We're small, and, but we enjoy that, that smallness. Next slide. Next slide, please. But even with, with us being small, we have the Rocky Mountain Rep Theater, and it's really one of the anchors, probably a key anchor of our creative district. They've been around for over 50 years. Um, over 1,500 people a year audition to come to the performances. 
uh, we get, they are Broadway level performances. And it's, you know, I often tell people, I said, where else can I live where I'm 10 minutes away from a Broadway performance and 12 minutes away from one of the best national parks in the country. So we had all of these wonderful features. And what for us, where our demographics are, are old, our, our median age is about 65 years old. So we have many creative people, but most of them are not professionals, um, but, but they are very much involved in the arts. Our quilting guilds are large, lots of painters. We have people doing classes and so on. Uh, but we've got venues that, that belong to the town or that, again, like Rocky Mountain Rep Theater, that we are trying to take advantage of that helps us build that, that professional uh, level of, of artists and creative people. Um, this year, unfortunately, with the fires, um, two of our gallery owners lost their houses. Um, and so they're recovering from that as well as from COVID. And, and um, we lost RMRT last summer. And, and for us, RMRT is a part of our lifestyle here. It's, it's, we, there's, we have pride in it, the fact that we have that level of performance, but it's the fact that we do have that kind of performance we can go to in a small town. And, and so when we don't have it, um, you know, it impacts us in a lot of ways, not just financial. Um, the rep theater is a tremendous asset and, and they're, they're working hard. Um, and we had some meetings the other day and got some big things planned moving forward. So we're excited about it. One of the things that is very, um, has been very valuable to us, we got a, a technical assistance grant from CCI this past year. And last uh, winter, we had to take down the town marquee. It was an iconic uh, marquee we had in town and it was um, uh, wood structure, mortise and tenon construction. So very reminiscent and very characteristic of the town. So with the money we got from uh, CCI, we, the town had decided they were gonna put some money into the budget to replace the marquee and we applied for the grant and that would help us get the money and apply it to replacing our marquee. We did a call to artists and we got, we had, uh, had then made a public vote of tourists and residents to pick the winner. And this is the one you see here down to the, um, the bottom there. And I've been amazed at the response we've gotten from people on, on this marquee and, and how they see it establishing a, a brand for, for Grand Lake and our creative community. And what I really love about it, if you look across the top, kind of that oval that comes across there, that was designed by a Ute, native Ute um, a woman. She's an artist in Denver. And that tell, that's going to tell the story of the Utes. The Utes were the first ones who occupied this valley. And unfortunately, you know, we, we don't give them enough credit for what they did here and what, who they were. And so this is a way for us to bring back that story so everybody really knows what, what this area was like and, and who the people were that really settled, settled this valley long before we were here. Next slide, please. Um, if you see the, the top left picture, that's, that's looking out. Down where the green is, that's Grand Lake. Up above it is Rocky Mountain National Park. Last year, if I had taken that picture, that would all be dark. That would all be woods. That's the fire that went through and the damage it created. It was, it was very devastating for people here um, to say that people are going you know, with PTSD after COVID and now losing the houses is to you know, kind of understate it. So, but, but the amazing thing about our community is just like looking at RMRT, that, that was a community to built a state-of-the-art theater that has existed for 50 years now. And if you look there at the bottom right, that's our community house. And that's where the RMRT operated for, for 40 years before we built our current um, um, theater. And we just found out the other days we're coming up on 200 years for that building. It is a state historic structure. 
And so we see that the community house is one of the low hanging fruits we can take advantage of to help us recover our economy. And so we're right now working to uh, reach out. We're gonna start a GoFundMe campaign. We need good sound in there and some lighting upgrades. And so we're gonna start um, that GoFundMe campaign to bring, get those upgrades. And then in two years, when it comes down to our 100, an, 100 year anniversary, we're already talking about a year of, of events in that, that structure there to celebrate what, I like to think of it as maybe it's gonna be an Austin city limits or an E-town, you know, that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to see ourselves as being incubators for the arts and particularly in the performing arts. So we've got big dreams, but, but we think we can get there. The other thing that has been amazing or a great asset, and so already Margaret mentioned it earlier, is we've got a space to create grant. Um, like most of the mountain towns that rely on tourism, uh, real estate has gotten out of, out of reach for most young people. Two of our restaurants had to shut down this past year because they could not get employees to, to uh, run, the, run their operations, help them run their operations. And so space to create, we're currently in process in the design phase. And hopefully within the next two to three years, we will have, have um, some affordable housing in town for our, for our creative people and our workforce. The other thing we're doing is that uh, again, Grand County is a small county. We're only 14,000 employees. Um, but again, the history and the creative uh, capital we have in the county is amazing. And so we're now working with um, Frazier and we're working with Kremling to, to put together more of a critical mass so that when people come to um, Grand County or, or when they look at it as a destination, and especially as people looking for the creative arts, there's a lot for them to come and see. Um, you know, when we tell people we're 400, they think, oh, well, you're nothing there. But <laughs> there is a lot here, and we think we can improve it with working together with, with Frazier and, and Kremlin. And so we're optimistic. Um, we think we've got a big future. It's not going to be easy, but, but we're looking forward to the challenges. And like I said, it couldn't have happened without the support we've gotten so far from CCI and the legislature. And, and so we really want to thank everybody for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And thanks to all the creative district speakers for sharing a little bit more about how creative districts impact your community. Um, it's really amazing the return on investment in creative districts. So I'll pass it back over to Kristen for uh, the next part of our meeting. We're not too far behind schedule. So good job, everyone. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you, Margaret. And again, I want to thank all of our speakers from the creative districts today, Karen, Tariana, Haley, and Ken. It was really powerful to hear from all of you um, about your communities, your personal stories, very inspiring to hear about the innovation in your communities, but also disconcerting to hear about the challenges that, that you're all facing. And, um, you know, your, your communities and, and vital neighborhoods throughout the state, um, we just really appreciate all that you do. And um, again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. One thing I wanted to say, I noticed in the chat there was a lot of you uh, reaching out to each other, talking about how you could collaborate. And I really do think collaboration is how we're all gonna get through this. So that was wonderful to see you reaching out to each other. And, um, you know, again, um, however, however we can all support each other through this. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna real quickly, I know we are just a couple minutes behind and I do wanna make sure there's time for Q&A with the legislators and I wanna thank the legislators who are hanging on with us. Um, so just real quickly, um, I was asked to talk about a few examples of innovation and collaboration both locally and nationally. So I'm gonna hit this super, super fast, but I do think there's a few worth mentioning that I think folks could um, do some research and check out afterwards that might be helpful. Um, one thing I want to mention that was very recent over the holidays um, was the Arts Through It All holidays campaign, Gifts of Art from the Heart. Um, this really came about through um, collaboration through our regional cultural partners. 
And um, it, the campaign initially launched um, back in April at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to support the arts sector um, and evolved. And over the holidays, um, we had a, a full-blown campaign and I hope it helped um, some of the organizations with our messages to give, gift shop local and support arts and culture over the holidays. Um, I would love any feedback, anecdotal, anecdotal feedback, if you, if you um, heard any, um, anything in your communities about how it helped arts organizations um, through the holidays, whether that's gifts of membership or classes or, or um, an increase or boost in donations during that time. Um, we are updating that campaign for the first quarter and there is a toolkit for arts and cultural organizations to use in their communities and their creative districts to, to customize for your own needs. So please check out artsthroughitall.org and utilize that, the assets of that toolkit. Um, and I also wanna thank the sponsors who have helped make this possible. The city of Denver um, through CARES Act funding helped support it as well as Denver Arts and Venues, Adams County, City of Boulder, PNC Bank, um, and Bonfi Stanton Foundation really have been funding this Arts Through It All campaign. So again, um, thank you to all of those wonderful sponsors and collaborators. I also wanna mention um, some of the other innovative things we've been seeing over the past year, if it sparks some ideas around drive-in concerts, front porch arts classes, virtual dance and theater performances, as well as outdoors, people utilizing spaces outdoors when the weather cooperates with us, online music classes. Um, this sector has been so creative and innovative over the last 10 months and will continue to be um, as we learn from each other. I know the hashtag arts find us collaboration between Athena Project and K Contemporary Art Gallery is one that comes to mind um, that was very creative. There's also a lot of innovation happening outside Colorado that we can learn from. For example, the Artists at Work pilot program in Western Massachusetts. Um, Google it, check it out. This is based off a, a WPA or Works Progress Administration um, type New Deal program. Um, what they've done is they've formed triads that include an artist, an arts and cultural organization, and a focused on a social impact issue in their community. So they're doing some really interesting work. Um, I know they have their, their eye on Colorado next as a, a second pilot market, um, if we can help support that with some funding. And so um, again, check out the Artists at Work program and that might be something that we can explore here in our state. Also, there's Americans for the Arts Put Creative Workers to Work proposal. So if you haven't checked that out on APTA's website, please do that as well. So with that, um, I would like to move to the q and I know some of you um, put some questions in the Q&A, but many of those were, were already answered um, in, a, in a typed um, response. Um, there was a couple questions I saw in the chat, and I'm not sure if, if those got answered, um, but there was one I know um, in particular for um, Dr. Seaman, there was a question I saw in the chat about um, a figure for design and advertising. If you want to address that, um, Michael, um, as well, that would be great. And then I'd love to be able to turn it back over to questions for legislators to wrap up. Michael, you're on mute. I'm not sure. <laughs> My chat has like 100,000 chats in it. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, so the question was based on the data. Is there any pullout um, around design and advertising figures? That's what I saw. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, there are, uh, there is uh, in the actual report. And what I can do is, let me see if I have a link to everyone. What I'll do is I'll put a link to the report in the chat. And it has all the data. Um, like more specific data within it uh, and in the appendix as well. Perfect, that's wonderful. Um, I just saw a couple others come through um, from Sarah. Are there any updates on interest and ability to create or attract an impact investing fund to invest in Colorado creatives? I don't know if any of you um, have any thoughts or comments on that. Um, I'll put it out. 
I'll put it out to anybody if you have any thoughts. Otherwise, I, I know I can share what I know, but if any of you um, have any comments about that question. Uh, what I will say with that is my understanding is it is ongoing. Um, I know there are, are folks that are heavily involved in, in um, attempting to put together an impact investing fund to, to, uh, in Colorado. Um, it, it's, it's challenging, um, which I won't get into the details of why, but it's, it's really the um, uh, investors that, um, you know, uh, kind of um, being able to work with impact investors to explain the ROI of investing in creatives and sometimes the communication around that is challenging. So I know that there's still a lot of work being done um, to put together a, a few examples so that people can learn from them. And, and um, there are groups in New York City that are taking the lead on this, but there are also people in Colorado that are trying to put together this type of impact investing for creative funds in Colorado. Um, so I don't know if any of you have any more thoughts on that. That's a quick answer, which is not very, which is kind of vague. So I apologize, but um, I know it's an ongoing uh, work in progress. Um, there's another question. Um, do any of us know uh, if our host today, if Americans for the Arts is planning to hold their Arts Action Summit this spring um, as they have done prior to 2020? And does a delegation from Colorado plan to participate? I have not heard anything. Um, just a quick response from that, um, from, from AFTA. Um, I know the State Arts Action Network will be meeting in, in April uh, virtually, but as far as AFTA's Arts Action Network that they typically have in March uh, in DC, I have not heard yet um, any specifics, but if any of you have, please, um, answer in the Q&A or the chat. Um, for the panelists, what has been the greatest tool in your success and what is the greatest need at this point for your recovery? I'll put it out to any of the panelists that want to respond to that. It's a great question. I think our greatest um, tool towards success has been malleability every like you're talking about theater on the back of trucks or you know how can we reinvent ourselves and i are uh, i think the answer for what's going to help us is the same as everybody we need business right we we need to figure out how we can maintain uh, moving forward and creating um, i don't know how, how, sales we need to generate the sales again right Anyone I think for us in on? Trinidad also, it's been a matter of keeping the community together as one. Mm -hmm. So we've put together several online projects that have been very helpful. It doesn't, as Karen just mentioned, bring in a lot of money for our creatives, but we've also, through grants from CCI, been able to hire local artisans and artists and um, creative entrepreneurs to provide things that that we need in our space to create um, project and such so you know that money has been spread out over the community and has helped minimally but still helped to keep our local artists employed during this time frame so that's been a real help to us in Trinidad certainly just from from Grand Lakes perspective um, I mean, it's always, you know, it always going to be money, but, but it's, we've also finding what's important now for us is, is really coming together. And, and even though we've been a tight community, it's important we, we really come together and start getting focused and start identifying things that we can accomplish. Um, and, and, 
you know, the, the help that's out there with the, with the arts relief grants and so on, that's going to help our local artists. But, but we see from our perspective, we've got to look at that as, as a creative district board, we've got to look at that bigger picture and that, that overall economy. And, and so it does. That's why we're, we're looking at a project like the community house, because that, that will bring people to town. And, and when, if we can bring those people to town, then our artists can get exposed and, and, and sell their goods. So it's, it's multi-layered, it's, it's, it is a big challenge, it's not easy, but you know, we all know <laughs> a, a, an arts community is not easy anyway, so for a lot of reasons. But, but I, I think just the fact you've, you sit down and you get focused and you lay out of that plan. Thank you. Well, I want to take our last couple of minutes um, for the legislators um, that are still with us. I want to again thank Rep Representative Amabile, uh, Senator Bridges, um, Senator Heisey, Representative Roberts, Representative Snyder, um, Representative Van Beber, and Senator Woodward for joining us today. We know you are all busy and we really appreciate you, you taking this time with us, um, especially as, as we know, there's a, a, a lot happening right now, blowing up, my phone's been blowing up with some unrest at our nation's capital, and we know people are gathering at our state capital, so um, we really appreciate you hanging in there with us. Um, but we wanna make sure as legislators, you have an opportunity to ask questions if there are some that you have for us that we haven't addressed, as well as our attendees today and panelists, if you have any additional questions directly directly for our legislators. So in our last few minutes, if, if there are any questions, I'd like to open up the floor. This is Megan. I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, Senator Heisey was one of the bill sponsors of a rural arts grant program last session and just thank him for his work on that. Obviously the bill didn't move forward because of funding challenges, but um, appreciate his work on that with other sponsors, uh, Senator Todd and some others as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. Kristen, it looks like we have a question from Tom Ward. Okay. Is that in the Q&A? Q uh, Tom, you are able to unmute if you'd like to ask your question. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello, this is Tom. Hi, Tom. Hi. I don't know if you can see me. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, we can't see you, but we can hear you. All right, that's fine. Um, yes, yeah, I started a collaboration project with 10 other artists in 2020, and it's at um, Colorado Mills Mall right now. We're talking to the Dairy Block about moving it there after it comes down. Um, but my long-term goal is to grow it, add you know, possibly dozens of other artists and have it go to other cities and eventually go international is my goal. Um, but I'd like any advice on who I should be talking to um, about other venues and funding. And I public I put a link up, I put some links up on the chat. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I did see one other one come in um, in the chat from Norwood Creech. Um, Has there been any discussion of unions or guilds for artists, performers, arts work, industry folks? Would anyone like to address that question? I'll respond in, uh, in terms of um, the venues in Colorado. Um, the independent venues have typically competed with one another historically. Um, and due to COVID, they have all come together. Uh, they formed the National Independent Venues Association and just most recently have formed the Colorado Independent Venue Association. So that's one that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, and, you know, again, it was one of those interesting outcomes where they realized they were stronger together than working, working at odds against one another. So um, that, that, that is one example. 
Thank you, Margaret. Um, all right, unless there are any other questions, again, I would just like to thank all the speakers, um, panelists, and, and mostly legislators for joining us today. Um, if, if the legislators have any final comments, again, want to provide you with that, that opportunity. Um, otherwise, I'll put in a real quick plug, just a reminder that the Colorado Arts Relief Fund uh, applications are due January 8th for both individuals and organizations. Um, but with that, um, again, thank you. And, and again, if any legislators would like to say any parting words, please do so. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mark Snyder here. And, uh, you know, I, we, I think we recognize that seven and a half million dollars is, is, doesn't go anywhere near what we would need to really support our arts communities here in Colorado. But I just want to give a shout out to so many local organizations local groups of concerned citizens that are doing everything they can to support our arts artists and musicians and others. And they may never get any recognition or, you know, any kudos for the work they do, but it's so vital. And, uh, you know, we're all in this together and it's going to take that type of approach to get through all this. So thank you all for this wonderful presentation. And thanks to all the folks that we don't even know about that are out there working every day to, make things better for our friends in the arts community. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Snyder. Very well said. All right. Well, with that, we're right at 1.30. Um, so thank you all for your, for your time. And um, again, thank you to Arts for Colorado and to CCI for your work in collaborating with CBCA on this Arts Caucus today, as well as a huge shout out to Megan Wagner and all of her support um, and Meredith Badler on the CBCA team who really did a lot of this, this work in pulling this together. So thank you both. Um, and everybody have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it.